And uh, yeah, I can see that there's already people here. So we're going to kick things off right now. We got Lisa Forrest from Live Oak Bank. We're going to be talking about SBA changes starting in just a moment. I'm David C. Barnett, and you're tuned in to Small Business and Deal Making, the podcast, YouTube channel, and blog, where I talk about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses while controlling risk. So if you're looking to take control of your future through buying a business one day, or if you already own a business and you're looking to grow or exit, you've come to the right place. I talk about interesting things, I talk to interesting people, and I answer your questions every week right here. So be sure to hit like, and be sure to hit subscribe, and let's get to it. Are you thinking of growing your business or beginning a journey into entrepreneurship? Take a shortcut to success by buying an existing and profitable business the right way. Visit businessbuyeradvantage.com and learn more about my online training, group coaching, and consulting services designed to help you win. All right, and uh, we're back with Lisa Forrest from Live Oak Bank. How are you today, Lisa? I'm doing well, thanks for having me, David. Good. We've already got people crowding in here. We've got uh, Kevin who joins us from Lakeland. He's already signed in. We've got Michael here who's in uh, in Connecticut and Florida, probably not at the same time. But uh, people are people are in because people are curious. And you're you, you've been on my program many times. The last time was in February, and you talked a little bit about some of the changes to the SBA seven A program that you thought may be coming along because of the the consultation process that is undertaken. And why don't we dial the clock back maybe to earlier this summer, and why don't you tell us about the information they did release as far as what they were contemplating? I'll let you word how, how yeah. it should be worded. So, and, and, and I'll state for the record, I actually tried to get out of the live stream today, didn't I? Where I said, hey, do we, do we actually want to push this back? We, we, um, when, we, when we set up today's meeting, that was like three months ago. We thought we'd have plenty of yeah. time for us to digest it and for just lenders, not, you know, all lenders to really kind of understand it and figure out what they're thinking about it. And then even on Friday, I was like, oh, should we, should we push it back some more? And I think you wanted me to talk about the confusion. So I'm here to. Yeah. Because, because I'll tell you, I'm listen to this. I'm, I'm the spectrum that I'm hearing online is that there are some voices in the online space talking with a high degree of authority about the things you can do and these new deal structures and everything and nothing's been confirmed right, right? and i and i so i think that's an important thing that we get across to everyone today is that there's a discussion about the changes um i released a video about the sba changes based on some comments that someone had put up on an article but and and I don't know if all of them are completely true or not. But but I want to hear it from you. Like, what was the proposal that finally got released as uh, as going to be happening? So there was an SBA release that came out on August first. So if you go online and I and I can send you links to the SOPs that did get released on August first. So that that okay. was the fifty ten dash six. Now since then. There has been something called expected technical updates. That is now going to be called 5010-7, and those are called expected technical updates. So that is um, the commentary by NAGL. That's the Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders. That's the technical update that's been, um, there's an overview on it where some of the technical updates that are expected have been summarized by NAGLE. I can also send that out. Uh, the technical updates have not been finalized and stated in writing by the SBA. So, so, the, so the, the earlier document, the Dash 6 document came out with these new ideas and a lot yeah. of people said, hey, what about this? What about that? People had questions and that's what the second document is supposed to address. Yeah, because because I think it's it's not a surprise um, that some of the changes were were pretty aggressive or you know pretty um, I, I don't want to say out there that's my lender view. There's a lot of people that thought all the changes were amazing because they're they were pretty aggressive. So I guess there uh, so uh, a lot of folks at the SBA level and even a lot of lenders thought that maybe some of the changes were a little bit too aggressive. And so there's been this expected technical update 
that's come out in response to what was actually released on August 1st. Okay. And so we can, I've highlighted like five things that I think most acquirers and lenders and uh, folks in this M&A, SBA M&A space are probably most interested in. So I, I just picked five things to talk about, David, and, and then you can, okay. you can add on from there. Um, so you've, you've got what been released and then you have probably the two or three areas that lenders are um, going to allow or not allow. And so okay. at least with Live Oak, we are actually going off of the expected technical updates. Some lenders okay. might not be choosing to do that. So uh, I guess it's kind of buyer beware or buyer's choice. However, you decide to look at that, depending on which lenders you talk to that might um, in, be interpreting things. Uh, in so, certain- so some lenders may take that first release document, 10, 10, uh, 50, 10 6 and they may just be running with that saying right. our policies are now set based on what they've told us. And so yes. those people could be doing deals today based on how they interpret that document. You're kind of waiting to see what these clarifications are going to be to, before you implement your <laughs> policies precisely. Well, at least what we're hearing in, in our conversations with our um, government association, NAGAL, and just our, com- and, you know, we're the nation's number one SBA lender. So we, we have a presence, um, you know, back in DC, we have of people that sit there full time um, and are, you know, kind of hearing certain things uh, from from some of the SBA um, um, officers, if you will. And uh, we're 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 going off of this expected technical update. That's what okay. we're choosing to do. So, what were the what were the five big things off of that August first document that uh, you think might be of interest to people? And I know I keep moving around because when I blurred the background, I've got this light fixture up here that keeps popping up. Sorry. Uh, so let's start with this idea of partial buy-in. Okay. And a lot of folks are calling it rollover equity. It technically is partial buy-in. And what that and this is what I do believe we know. We know that you are partially buying into the seller's existing entity. So it would be a stock purchase. Okay. You uh it depends on, we think it depends based on the technical um, update. It depends on how much ownership the seller had prior to six months, kind of a six month look back, it's called six months prior to the sale. How much ownership did the seller have and how much uh, ownership are they going to have going forward? So you are partially buying into their entity. And then they're going to retain a certain amount. So it's our understanding today, Live Oak Bank's understanding. I'm just going to say that because I don't. Mm-hmm. And, and again, this is really uncomfortable territory for me. Not, you know, I'm, I'm I don't want to have to retract later, but there are some things I'm saying now that my may or may not yeah. uh, come to pass. So I'm going to just put that asterisk in a lot. At least what how Live Oak is interpreting it is if six months prior to the transaction, if the seller owned more than 20% and they're going to, so it doesn't matter how much they own uh, post close. If they own more than 20% within six months, they're going to be required to personally guarantee. So, so for example, if you're talking about a business that might have multiple owners, like six owners, and that would mean maybe the person who's selling does not own 20%, then then that would be the kind of circumstance perhaps that we're talking about here. So most of the time, these sellers of these small and medium-sized businesses are, are majority owners, right. almost all the time, right? So I think I think what what the new rule tries to rectify, which I think everyone was for, everyone was for this thing that I'm about ready to say, and that was you've got a company where there's, say, to your point, like five owners, one owner owns 75%. And then you've got two, three, four owners that own 5%. They were given incentive comp as part of their, their pay, pay scale to incentivize them to stay on. So they got 5% ownership. When in 
reality, they're the shop manager or the floor manager or the estimator. They've got some really robust role in the company and it was part of their incentive cop. So at least our interpretation is if they owned less than 20% within six months of the, the sale, they could stay on and not have to personally guarantee. They own less than 20% pre-sale. They're going to own less than 20% post-sale. Those folks can stay on for an, an unlimited amount of time. Now, keep mm. in mind, you can't add their salary back because they're still going to have salary going forward. And so there's, you know, there's other, other um structuring aspects you have to take into consideration. But if they own 75% before, and now they're going to own 15% and stay on, um, they would have to personally guarantee. That's that's what we're what we think. Okay. And so in order for a seller to agree to do that, then obviously they would have to have a great deal of faith in the buyer. Right. Yeah. So so in my imagination, when I'm thinking about these scenarios, I'm thinking that a lot of the times when this could actually come into play, it'll be one of those maybe minority owner internal people is kind of like taking the senior ownership role and the seller has known that person for many years and trusts them and knows that they're capable and is so willing to do this personal guarantee. So it's it's not just carte blanche that everyone can go out there and start offering to buy 80% of companies and and borrow and the seller just gets away with you know, the money on closing day, these sellers are going to have to be participating and, and trust that everything's going to be great. Yeah, absolutely. And the trust factor is huge because now our, our new acquirer, if you've got anyone staying on retaining ownership and personally guaranteeing your loan, I mean, they're a borrower, they're, they're a partner, even if you've got even if they're less than 20% and they're not personally, excuse me, they're not personally guaranteeing your loan if they stay below 20%, but still you've got an automatic partner. You've got someone also uh, uh, as part of the ownership structure. But we think yeah. though, it seems that that was the kind of a really awkward thing that was difficult before with the with the rules where everyone had to exit, even if they were sort of, um, you know, just that floor manager. And, you know, it's a, hey, it's a key role. It's, it's someone that you want to stay on and it makes sense for your transaction. Uh, we think we think that that's what the SBA was getting at with um, allowing a partial buy in. OK, so partial buy in. There was a, there were there was a lot of news about that. What, what would be the next thing on your list? Uh. Next thing on the list is probably going to be around injection. Okay. I think that's always a big um, topic of conversation. How do you how do you adequately structure an SBA loan? It's already designed to be highly leveraged, and it's already designed. The SBA guarantee is already designed um, to mitigate lack of collateral. So by injection, you mean the amount of equity the buyer brings to the deal? Correct. And the amount of equity that is coming into a transaction. It's always been low. That's been part of the program because you've got the SBA guarantee behind that bank loan, guaranteeing it if something you know bad happens. So for, the, for a really long period of time, it was 10% down was required. And then there was a, a by the buyer, buyer, and maybe some of their investors, the buy team, ten percent down. And generally, you had a ten or a fifteen percent seller note, and the bank was doing seventy-five to eighty percent financing. That was a kind of a real industry standard structure for a really long time. And then there was an asterisk that got introduced, where of that ten percent down, five percent minimum had to come in from the buyer, buyer team. And 5% could be in the form of a seller note on full standby for the life of the loan. So that was a, an asterisk we had for a really long period of time. And the bank could choose to do basically kind of 95% financing, 5% down, 5% full standby seller note. And then the bank was doing 90% financing. So, so the, the, seller, asterisk, the seller could potentially wait 10 years to correct. get the last 5%. Okay. Correct. And I'm going back to now talk about now where we're at. Now we have kind of another double asterisk. Uh, so with the with the latest change, the the rule was two and a half percent equity from the buyer, 
seven and a half percent in the form of a seller note. And then the rest could be bank SBA financing. So in the S SOP 15106, it changed it to two and a half minimum, seven and a half seller note. And it um, so now, though, the technical the, the technical change now is that you've got the two and a half and the seven and a half. That seems to have st stood. But now on that seven and a half, if you've got it, it you've got two things. You've got it has to be on on um, no uh, a two year twenty four month P and I from the seller. So it's a two year note. And I know I'm tripping over my words. Some of these changes with no payments, no interest. So the the technical thing is that if you've got it on interest only, okay, that can count for your your equity. But that has to be able to be included in the debt service coverage. So you could have as okay. low as two and a half percent from the buyer, seven and a half percent seller note on a two year term with interest only payments. But that has to be included in the, the debt service coverage. That makes sense to me because it's it's debt service. Right. So that whatever the bank's debt service coverage is, it could be, a you know, one point two five. Live Oak is at 1.5 debt service coverage. That two-year amortization on that seller note would have to actually fit into the debt service coverage. That's really, it's kind of a, that's really hard to do. That's really, really hard to make two-year am fit into an SBA loan, but um, that's what it would have to happen. And then there's another element. If you have your seven and a half percent. So, so, so hang on, hang on, hang on. The, 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 the seller's note, it's, it's on standby for two years, but but uh, that doesn't mean necessarily that the note is supposed to amortize over two years, does it? So so there's two elements. So the first part I'm talking about is if it's on a two year term with interest only. Okay. So the seven so that and a half interest percent, is part of your debt service. Okay. Yeah, it has to be part of your debt service coverage. So this is what the SBA has done. They said, okay, two and a half, seven and a half, and the seven and a half can be on a two year term. That's that's what this SBA has said that, that you could have your that seven and a half from the seller can be on a two year amortization. So they took this whole ten year full full standby, and they've dropped it to two years. Okay, so <clears throat> that's interesting. I mean, my understanding was the standby was for two years, but you could say it was a sixty month note, for example, and have oh, it you could. For five years. You could structure it lots of different ways, but I'm okay. saying they're giving you the opportunity to have it only be for two years. Yeah, okay, I can see how this would be incredibly tight because yeah. the, the the principal and interest on a two year amortized debt is like, that's, ex yeah, exactly. it would be a big payment relative so, to the so amount of money. So I'm just telling you what SBA has suggested is allowable. Now what's reasonable and what, what you can really execute on are gonna be two different things. Okay. So they, they've sort of let the seller off the hook from that 10 year full standby down to two years. But if it's interest only, you have to be able to include it in debt service coverage. Okay. So the the reduced buyer required down payment is sort of the second big element. What what's the next big element of change? Well before we go off of that, and, and okay. David, can you see me? Because for some reason my video has just completely gone away. Yeah, you're like you're just stopping and starting a little bit. Okay. But that spaceship isn't trying to abduct you anymore. Okay. Well, as long as you have to verbally let me know if 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 you can't see me, because right now I have just blank screens. So I'm just talking to you with a blank screen. Okay. okay. So before we move off of that, there is another part to that too, that if it is on full standby, it has to be on full standby for two years um, with no P&I payments for two years for it to count also. There's a kind of that interest only and then the two year, no, no P&I. Um, but again, if it's on so, interest only, you have to be able to include so, it in debt service. Okay, so I'm confused then. So if it's interest only, but there's no P&I payment, does that mean the interest accrues? Did you did you hear my question? So I so if it's not, if it's so okay sorry. so if it's if it's a if it's a two year interest only but there can't be any P and I payment does that mean for two years the interest accrues on the note? So and again I know this SBA just got into 
so many different nuances, if then this, if that this, it just, okay. you know, it's really crazy. So again, there's the two year term. If it is, if for those two years, you're paying your seller interest only on their note, that interest can certainly, you know, then you have to definitely be able to include that two year amortization on in within your debt service coverage. Okay. Okay. Now, if it is two years, again, there's a, they put this 24 months on here. If they're, if you are not paying P and I for two full months, then yeah, interest can accrue to that seller. Okay. All right. So, okay. Interesting. So I, I can say, and I can see how, how the industry is kind of saying like some of these things are maybe a little bit confusing. Uh, confusing and pretty aggressive. For you to only bring in two and a half percent down on, because you've had lots of podcasts about over levering and a yeah. good cap stack and what makes a fair structure for everybody. So now you're just coming in with two and I think you can buy a car. You buy, yeah, got to put more money down on a car than you do, uh, you know, a business at two and a half percent down. Is the SBA loan uh, guarantee increasing at all for you guys? The, the amount of the principal that's guaranteed still, by them? You're still 75% of the loan outstanding is the guarantee. So the, the, the guarantee hasn't changed at all. So, so, but what they're doing effectively with some of these rules is making the portion that the bank is exposed to more risky. Oh, yes. Uh, in my opinion, in, in, in our opinion, yes. And I think in a lot of opin uh, lenders' opinions, yeah. You're, you're, you're um, bleeding off risk taking for the seller. You're putting more risk on the bank. And you are, I think, and there's going to be lots of different opinions here. So I don't want to say anyone's doing it in a wrong way. This is just our personal opinion, my, my opinion as a banker. And then you are um, potentially allowing a buyer to get in with very little money. And you're putting mm. all the, and by the way, you know, when you, when your loan doesn't work out, I mean, you know, bad stuff happens to you as a buyer. So yeah. hopefully you've got it structured well enough going into it. So I don't think there are going to be many lenders doing this two year, you know, on the hook with the seller for only two years. Yeah. And, and, and just to, just for everyone to remember, you know, the SBA program rules is one set of rules, but then the bank's own policies kind of sit on top of that. And this is why we get some variations from one lender to the next about what kind of deal they're willing to do and stuff, because they, they have their own, I don't know, uh, rules, but it may be also preferred industries or deal types and all this other kind of thing that applies in this market. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I at least wanted to talk about what the changes are, but then finding banks that are going to do X, Y, and Z, that's up to you to, you know, um, do, do your research and your homework for sure. Uh, and for us, um, our debt service coverage, we have always included the seller note payment whether you got interest only for a year and, you know, there's so many different ways to structure a, a seller note, which is awesome. That's great. You want that flexibility deal to deal. But if you've got, even if it's amortized over 10 due in five, we're, we're, we're likely including that debt service coverage on a five-year, five-year am in our debt service coverage. Our philosophy is that you should be able to afford the purchase price today, not yeah. Not well. I'll worry about it in two years. Oh, some lender will refinance me in two years, or I'm going to have enough cash flow in two years to now start debt servicing this uh, seller note. Which, you know, hopefully you've transitioned your company well in two years, let alone growing it to make a payment you can't afford today. I, I listen. I'm, I'm a big proponent. I'm a big proponent of not gambling that you will qualify for credit at some point in the future. We just we don't know what the conditions are going to be. Right. Um, okay. And now I know so, there's, you know, if we did a little panel, we could have a point counterpoint and there could be, you know, another one of my colleague competitors that would, you know, discuss this in a different way. So again, I'm just, you know, pointing out what the potential rule changes are. Um, okay. And what's next on your list? Yeah. So I would say um, the other um, other area is your being able to use your home equity loan without having to have outside payment to cover that uh, HELOC increase. So um, you can borrow on your home equity loan line 
before you used to have to have outside income, um, you know, maybe some sort of dividend or interest income or maybe spousal income mm -hmm. that wasn't part of the company that you are acquiring. So even if your salary that you're going to be taking out of the company and it fits into debt service just fine, you couldn't use your acquisition company salary to pay for an increased uh, debt on a HELOC. SBA has now changed that rule that as long as the company can pay for your salary adequately on your personal living needs, including the HELOC increase, that that's a okay. I think it's a positive development. I mean, especially yeah, if you've been yeah. paying into your home, you've been actually taking your, you know, your income and paying down your home equity debt. To me, that's, you know, that, that should be equity that you should be able to tap. And now SBA is, is allowing that. Yeah, I would agree too. As long as uh, somebody in their forecast has an adequate salary for their, if, if they're going to become an owner operator, has an adequate salary there for them to be drawing that is going to allow them to afford that on a personal basis. I know, and um, you know, I, I know lenders here in Canada, like they'll look at a person's personal cash flow as well. When they're doing a business deal, they'll, they'll want to know if they've got expensive RV loans or car loans and all this other kind of stuff. They want to make sure that they can uh, balance everything on the personal side as well as the circumstances um, for the business loan. And, and so this makes sense to me. As long as you can adequately plan for and demonstrate that you've got the cash flow to, to make those payments, it, it should work out. Yeah, I was. this one seemed to sort of be across the board, you know, like, hey, that, that seems to make sense. Um, another area is for folks that might have coming into a, an acquisition, maybe a mid-career acquirer or a mid-career searcher that have built up personal financial wealth. And now they would like to, you know, acquire a company and, and you know, be their own, well, uh, be their own boss and, you know, have their own employees, et cetera. Um, there was a rule before that said that you could actually be too liquid to um, use the SBA program. And that always seemed to, you know, kind of catch um, catch people in a tweener stage because they're still buying a small business that might not be big enough to qualify for a conventional loan or qualify for a non SBA loan. And okay. then they, yes, I've built up my resources. I'm willing to use quite a, quite a bit of it to, to acquire a company yet. I can't go get a conventional loan because I'm looking at a $4 million company but they could really benefit from the SBA program. SBA before would say, oh, you, you might have too many liquid resources where you don't need the SBA. They have um, done away with that rule. As long as the lender can really justify the fact that except for the SBA loan, this person doesn't have access to a realistic uh, loan loan program. So that, that's how, kind of how was the... Way. How is the liquidity measured? Was it a, a net worth dollar figure or... Uh, only looking at certain types of assets that are more liquid? Like, what, what was the test for that? The test before was if your liquidity, that would be cash, savings, stocks, bonds, your liquidity, not 401k, uh, but your liquid assets. If they, if you had after your injection, after your equity contribution, you had more than the amount of the total financing package. If you had more than that in liquidity, you would have to keep injecting your liquidity into the SBA transaction and reduce the SBA loan. So let's say, let's say you had two and a half million dollars of kind of cash, stocks, bonds, savings, two million dollars. You injected five hundred thousand for uh, the equity requirement. You had a million and a half of liquidity left, and let's say between the SBA loan and the seller note say that was, you know, a million two fifty and you had a million five, the SBA had said one, you're ineligible, you have to inject another two fifty to, you know, um, make sure you don't have more liquidity available, or you're just completely ineligible. So it was really, it was really taking um a, a, a fair chunk out of the SBA pool, even though they might have been um too liquid from SBA standpoint, but they weren't that liquid and they weren't buying the kind of company that they were buying the kind of company that fit really well within SBA. So I, mm. I think they've sort of rectified that. Okay. And and so, and what it would also end up doing for that person is, is 
you know, make them in, be standing in a far less diversified position. It would also, you know, also make the note riskier because they wouldn't have as many resources to bring to bear if something went wrong in the business and they needed to put in more cash. Yeah. And then also what this is doing is leaving liquid resources for growth, buying another mm -hmm. company that can help them grow. So it just seemed like this, you know, it's not like we were having, you know, like billionaires trying to apply for SBA loans either too. It was this, this, you know, like 25% that just were, uh, you know, at that mid career or later that it was really negatively impacting. So. And we're still taking okay. collateral. We're still going to, it's not like they're getting away with anything. We're still going to take home collateral. And generally these people have more collateral to give us, not less. So it just seemed like we were taking someone out of the SBA uh, diversity pool that really would benefit everybody's benefit the program overall. We've got uh, we have more people piling in. We've got people. Uh, we got Lou who's joining us from Dallas. Victor is joining us from the UK. Hey, Victor, how are you today? And uh, he just remembered to give us a like, please. If you're watching, do give us a like, thumbs up, or uh, you know whatever there is available on the platform you happen to be on it helps uh, a lot with the algorithms. So, uh, what would be the what would be, that was the fourth thing that fourth yeah. thing then? And, and so, I, what I would the fifth thing be? I think those are four really good things to talk about. If we wanted, I don't know if you have Q and A going. Um, the other thing is that one thing is something. Um, just the fifth thing would be no earnouts. So it's not something they're allowing. It's just a confirmation that no earnouts are um, allowed. That that wasn't. There was a little rumor that now earnouts are allowed. You still can't base any part of your transaction on the company doing over and above. That the the seller gets a second note or a second uh, kind of tranche of um, enterprise value based on something you do more over and above, like increasing EBITDA, then he gets paid X, Y, and Z. So earnouts are still not eligible. And that was kind of my okay. fifth qualification. What, what about overall cap of $5 million? Uh, has that had some changes? I thought I saw something about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is where, I, you know, I might have a retraction coming, but uh, at, at least what we know now, at least our interpretation is that if you are, um, it has to do with affiliation, that there is a, a change to the affiliation rule, that now if you own a company in a certain NAICS code, in a certain geography, and now you buy a, another company in a different NAICS code, we're at least interpreting this, that you have access to an, an entire uh, additional $5 million of SBA guarantee. And sort of the reason I went out on a limb and I put something out on Twitter about it. And then I thought, ah, oh, I was really holding on to that nugget for a while because we don't have it. It hasn't been clarified in this follow-up um, technical certification. So I throw it out there. Okay. And and so was this something that was addressed in the first document? The, did they talk about it specifically? Yeah, or, it's in the or... first document. Okay. And we don't have any rumors that it has been rescinded. <laughs> okay, so so it's almost like they're they're openly willing to allow people to become more diversified by getting into different industries. Yeah, and especially if you're an existing operator, you've transitioned a company well, at least one company well. You've got that under your belt. Your your existing company is is do, doing well by all accounts, and now you want to diversify into a new NAICS code, it seems that you might have access to another $5 million of guarantee to, to go down that path. Okay. So as of right now, if, if a buyer were to negotiate a deal where they're kind of relying on one of these changes to, to make their deal work in a bank loan, what's, what's happening when they, when they go and apply with you? So, Always our value proposition is we want to talk to you early. So hopefully you're, I would highly recommend when you are working on LOIs and you're analyzing deals pre LOI, be talking to your lenders and, you know, be talking to a couple of lenders and find out how they might interpret certain aspects of what you're reviewing. You want to do that pre LOI. Okay. So, so you want, uh, to be sure that any of these iffy things are being avoided by people right now, presently, until these clarifications are made. Now, I'll just say out there, there's a lot of a lot of transactions you're looking at that don't have anything to do with these new rules and regulations. So let's talk about where you should have a lot of confidence. You've got a transaction where you're buying 100% of the company. 
you, you're already planning on bringing at least 10% equity yourself from you and your, your buy team. So you're bringing in 10% equity. You are contemplating a seller note, 10 to 15% seller note, and you've probably got a, at least a minimum of a five-year amortization on it or longer. Your debt service affords the SBA loan and the seller note at the acceptable threshold of the lender you're working with. That all, that's all real tried and true SBA. So we're still getting a lot of transactions done where it's really tried and true SBA hmm. lending. Uh, no, nothing to be concerned about. Um, this idea of this partial buy-in also, the seller role, got a lot of attention early on. There are a lot of lenders that really didn't know if there were going to be that many instances where that you know partial buy-in was really going to make a lot of sense. So I think there's a lot of SBA lending happening without any kind of confidence concern. Okay. So we, I think we, if you're we, trying to get really low on your equity, trying to take advantage of bringing in two and a half percent equity, definitely got to be talking to your lenders. If you've got um, any amount of the sellers wanting to partially stay on, that's where those are the two instances where you've got to be talking to your lenders. Yeah. And, and, and just to highlight for everyone, as Lisa and I were saying, you know, if, if someone is bringing in two and a half percent equity, um, it is going to make it a riskier proposition in the bank size. So you need to make sure you have the lenders buy in through the whole process that they think you're the right person, it's the right business, it's the right deal, and that your cash flow forecast makes sense. 100%. 100% yeah. on that. Uh, we have a question here uh, along this line. So Lou says, is collateral required if the buyer only puts two and a half percent down with the 7.5% seller note, if the debt service coverage ratio is really good, like two to one or 1.5 to one? Is there any kind of change about collateral? And maybe you can clarify what the collateral rule is with SBA loans. So the, the collateral rule hasn't changed. Uh, well, I have to say a caveat. I think um, and for some reason, my screen just went totally blank because I would want to look at my technical update here. Um, I think if the loan is above 500000 or above, then it's the same collateral rules that that um, that govern. And that is if you have the SBA program is supposed to be collateral agnostic. So let me let me put it that way. If you don't own a home, but we like everything else about the transaction, the lender is able to do a loan that isn't fully collateralized or is under collateralized because that's what the SBA program's there to do. But if you have a home and it has a lendable equity in it, then the lender is required to take that by the SBA. However, we're not looking to necessarily be fully secured if we like everything else about the transaction. So the fact that you've got um, you know, a 2.5% injection a bank, though, could decide, even though SBA would allow them to do the loan without additional collateral, the bank could decide if you want to come in with the, the, the minimal amount of equity required that we want more collateral. A bank could decide that. But, but the, yeah. the SBA rule um, allows it to be um, the loan given as long as you're taking the real estate collateral that you have. Yeah. And... You know, as far as the real estate collateral, you guys, uh, what you do is you put a, a lien on the house, right? Correct. And so uh, I had an interesting question the other day in a conversation with someone where they were asking about um, the SBA collateral rules uh, about you know, what happens in a worst case scenario. Like if, if for example, there was a, a bankruptcy or something, I guess that your lien would be there beforehand. So you'd be a, considered a secured creditor. Yeah, so we we literally secure, take a secondary or tertiary lien on your home. So we are there as a secured creditor on the house. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And great. Um, Lisa, this has been great. And I know that you were a little bit uncomfortable about coming on and talking about some of this stuff because of the fact that everything's up in the air. But I think it's important to let people know that things are a little bit up in the air, that they're, they may be listening to different uh, people online talking about different things. And and what when people say, this is what you can now do because this is something that they read, uh, it may actually be more difficult to pull off than what, they, than what it may seem. It really depends on finding a lender who's willing to do these things and willing to do them with the particular buyer. Yeah, and I would, as, as an acquirer out there, I would really ask your lenders that you're talking to, 
how do you interpret the rule? And then how are you interpreting it? You know, so, so what do you think the rule is? And then how, how is the lender applying that? I, I would be asking those two things. Yeah. Um, Lou's here with a follow-up question. He says, in Texas, we're not able to use our primary home as a collateral. So how does that work? Yeah, it's the um, Homestead Act in Texas. Yeah, your primary residence, the lender is not allowed to take a secondary lien on your primary residence. Um, vacation or rental properties would be fair game. It's the primary residence. So we're going to, we're already collateral agnostic. Um, when, when we're making decisions on SBA business acquisition loans, we're coming at it really from a debt service perspective. Yeah, what do you bring to it as an operator? So we're really not looking at it from a collateral standpoint. So as I mentioned before, if we were, um, if we like everything about the transaction, save for being under collateralized, because we're already under collateralized anyway, then you know, we certainly recognize in Texas that Homestead um, Act. And if we like everything else about the transaction, we're doing lots of loans in Texas. It's a very active economic uh, state for business acquisition. Yeah. Yeah. Very busy, very entrepreneurial place. Lisa, this has been great. Uh, thank you very much for taking some time out of uh, out of your summertime to to come and talk with us today. Got it. Well, thanks for having me on. And I, you know, at the risk of me coming back on in the fall, maybe we do it again when we know, you know, kind of this is the box and this is how we're utilizing it. But so hopefully I wasn't too confusing for everybody. No problem. How, what's the best way for people to find you online if they want to reach out and make contact with you, maybe discuss a deal? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lisa.forest, two R's at liveoak.bank. And we also have a weekly power hour every Wednesday. We go over details about SOP, uh, structuring, process roadmap. And then on our Thursday call, we share deal vetting templates with you. Executive summary template, a cash flow model. We have a qualitative model. We're doing that on the Thursday call. We're happy to have you um, send me an email. I can send you links to register for our Wednesday and Thursdays at 9 o'clock Pacific Standard. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the summer. Thanks, David. Bye now. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, we'll see you next time. So how can you learn more about buying, selling, financing, and managing small and medium-sized businesses? Easy. Go over to my blog site, davidcbarnett.com, where you can learn more about me and how I work with my clients. You can learn more about my books and courses that I've prepared for you. You can find out how to subscribe to my email list, the YouTube playlists, and more. There's literally hundreds of hours of content there, all for free, and I'd love for you to be my guest. Special thanks go to Mark Willis at Lake Growth Financial, today's video sponsor. Mark helps people better manage their personal and business finances through the bank on yourself insurance strategy. This is something I've done personally and I've seen others use it successfully for years. Go to newbankingsolution.com to find all the interviews I've done with Mark and learn more about the advantages of these programs. While there, sign up for a free consultation to learn what this solution might look like for you. This episode of Small Business and Deal Making is brought to you by smbpodcastnetwork.com. The network is a collection of podcasts and shows from around the internet which focus on bringing you interviews with amazing guests who share actionable advice, ideas, and information for small and medium-sized business owners and entrepreneurs. Visit www.smbpodcastnetwork.com to find more great shows and easily subscribe to be notified of new episodes. It's a great way to discover quality content. And if you've discovered us today via the network, then I hope you're enjoying the show and will consider subscribing directly so you never miss any one of our great episodes.